two humanoids while skiing in Finland. Two skiers encountered a 10 foot wide UFO in Finland while skiing and a three foot humanoid being came off I think down in a beam of light and it was carrying a black box that emitted a strong yellow beam of light from inside of it. We're going to look at some sightings tonight and some stories, some real world experiences about these UFOs that they don't know if they got enough information throughout the years to document when we know they do, when we know that they do. So I found some more and we're going to look at them. And they're short, the short descriptions. So we're probably going to look around 20, 20 or so short sightings of UFOs from all around the world. I'm going to come over here and, um, is that a screwdriver? I'm going to come over here. Welcome everyone. Hello, Apple Brooks, honey. Um, yeah, so we got it. We got it. You all. So but let's let's look at this. So I'm going to come over here and welcome, welcome everyone. Hello, Apple Brooks, honey. Um, that's wonderful, Patricia, in Brazil. Yes. So let's look at this. You all, we're going to come right over here. It's called a UFO evidence, and we're going to start looking close encounters, cases 17 through 32, ala 54 in this section. So, close encounters of the third kind. A youth reports UFOs with greenish creatures. January the 19th, 1977. Hara, Washington. Nine-year-old Jose Cantu of Hara woke up his mother about 6.30 a.m. asking her to explain the little man he saw outside, according to the boy. He had seen two greenish creatures about three feet tall, who rotated on a base instead of having feet, and two steely crafts, crafts made of steel, in which two other creatures were sitting. So there is a full report right there. Um, then we have another one. A 60-foot craft lands with two occupants in Las Vegas, Nevada, on January the 29th of 1976. Johnny Sands, a western, country western singer in Las Vegas, saw a 60-foot craft about 1,000 feet altitude, shaped like a Goodyear blimp, with portholes around the circumference. The object appeared to land, and Sands then saw two figures approaching. Then he froze. He wanted to move, but he couldn't. The figures came near him to about three feet away. And so all of these have um, full report, obviously has psychological effects with this. We even took a polygraph test. Um, UFO and humanoids tap young schoolboy on the shoulder. February the 23rd, 1975, Kofu City of Japan. Young Japanese school children watched a UFO touch down on February the 23rd of 1975. The landing took place near Kofu City, Yamanashi, uh, prefecture Japan the occupant allegedly emerged and touched one child on the shoulder temporarily paralyzing him the occupant then walked around the craft and reboarded the boys in hysterics ran home to their parents who observed a large red orange light hovering over the vineyard so they have um, a press report, a humanoid occupant landing, children, witness sketch, witness photo, physical trace. A uh, man taken into a craft encounter with three beings. Not, uh, January the 4th, 1975, Bahia Blanca, Argentina. Carlos Alberto Diaz, a clerk at a central store, was walking home from work when he was paralyzed after being blinded by a brilliant flash of light. You know when I see that description, blinded by a brilliant flash of light, you know what I'm thinking of? How um, Saul, 
He was blinded by the light, and he literally was blinded, and then he became Paul. Um, trying to resist, he was pulled off the ground, and when about three meters off the ground, he became unconscious. When Diaz regained consciousness, he was inside a smooth, bright sphere, which appeared to be semi-transparent plastic. Suddenly, Diaz reports, these three creatures resembling humans came sliding into the sphere. There's a full report. Uh, it's a standard case, psychological effects, abduction, humanoid occupant, witness photos, and humming. Um, there's another one. UFO with two occupants hovers over a man's car. 1975, San Antonio, Texas, United States. A 40-year-old San Antonio sheet metal worker claims he had a close encounter of the third kind with two occupants of a UFO. He was driving his pickup truck just south of San Antonio when he was approached, spotlighted, and nearly buffeted off the road by an unidentified craft. Investigators report. There's a full report. It's the San Antonio Evening News, February the 20th, 1978. Uh, it's a press report. There's humanoid occupants, vehicle interference. There's a witness sketch and a dyad scout craft. Uh, I don't know what a dyad scout craft is, you all, but this is really wild. So we have another one. Occupant case in Wisconsin. December the 2nd, 1974. Frederick, Wisconsin, United States. Farmer William Bosack, 68, had what he termed as a hair-raising experience December 2nd of 1974. As he was driving home, he spotted an object on the left side of the road ahead of him. It had a curved front of glass, and inside I could see a figure with its arms raised above its head. There's a full report. It's an APRO bulletin. Uh, it's a standard case. It's a humanoid occupant. October the 25th, 1974, Medicine Bowl National Forest, Wyoming, United States. Carl Higdon, while hunting elk, raised his rifle and fired, but the bullet only went about 50 feet and dropped. He heard a noise and looked over to see a sort of a man standing there. The man called himself Asso and asked Mr. Higdon if he'd like to go with him, and Higdon replied that he guessed so. The man pointed an appendage at this juncture. Mr. Higdon said he found himself in a transparent cubicle along with a sasso. Let's see, the, let's see, if, there, let's see if we can get this full report. I haven't heard of that before. Um, oh, we'd have to go get it. Let me see. Case, line. Oh, you can't get it. Sorry, you all. Server created object access error. There is no. Access is denied. Look at this. The call to service creator object failed while checking permissions. Access is denied. Okay, so now we know we can't click into them, you all. Um, that's fine. Robots in Quebec, Canada. July the 22nd, 1974. Uh, St. Creole, Providence, du Quebec, Canada. Mr. L was preparing to go to bed when he heard a strange sound like bum, bum, bum outside. He lifted the curtain in the living room and he saw a reddish orange round object hovering over the field to the northeast side of his house trailer. When he looked outside, he saw what he described as a robot like creature about six feet tall, within 15 feet of the trailer. This is a standard case. It's a physical trace of a humanoid occupant. Let's see what happens. No, we are going to be denied to all of that, you all. We're going to be denied to all of that. UFO with occupants approaches witnesses and hovers over a farm. In June the 14th, 1974, Medellin, in Spain. Santiago Pulido Romero, 46 years old, was going to his farmer's farm, father's farm, when he saw an object at low level. It was round on the bottom and was sort of a cone-shaped tower on top. When he switched his car lights on, the object came toward him at a very high speed. 
only to move away from he move away from he turned out the lights. Inside the craft, Santiago could see three tall men who seemed to be holding on to some sort of control layer levers and wearing helmets. So this is another one. Um, occupant encounter in New Hampshire. On November the 2nd of 1973, Manchester, New Hampshire, United States, as the car approached a point opposite the middle of the cemetery, the UFO closed possibly to within less than 500 feet. At this point, she estimated the object to be at the height of a three-story building. Wow. The figure in the window was now distinct. This is um, a UFO as tall, as big as a three-story building. Whoa, that's really big. I wish we could see these, and I know we can't because they're locked. All of it is locked. That is wild. The Isla de Lobos case in Uruguay. October the earth October the twenty eighth, nineteen seventy two. Isla de Lobos Uruguay Guay. Uh this is a single witness sighting and yet it has become the best case coming from Uru Uru Uruguay. Due to the in-depth investigation done by the members of the CIOVI research group, the witness Corporal Juan Fuentes saw a landed craft with three occupants at close range for a time of about one minute. He attempted to shoot at the occupants but was stopped from doing so. The occupants entered the craft and the craft rose up and flew away at a high speed. This is like a humanoid occupant landing military. You know what? I wonder if, um, wonder if, um, we could get anything off of that. Let me see this UFO sighting. Sighting. Let's see if we can get something off of that. Maybe not. Yeah, we got it. Are we got it? Oh, yeah, we got it. We got it. We got it. Let's read what they said. October 1972. A small island off the coast of Uruguay. I'm not saying it right. Situated where the River Plate and the Atlantic Ocean meet. One of the most intricately investigated close encounters in Uf UFO history in this area. Where it would unfold. The island is about to be all but deserted, save for a lighthouse, which the Uruguayan Navy maintained. It was during one such maintenance mission that a young corporal's life was changed forever. Um, I don't think you can send uh, links during a live video. We recently looked at a 1950 encounter of Bruno Faccini and declared how many the, the details that at first appear trivial are replicated in many other similar incidents. The case at Isla de Lobos Lighthouse is such another case, as well as corresponding details and incidents. Although skeptics argue only a single person witnessed the events, subsequent investigations will result in a tidal wave of psychological tests from experts in different fields all would ultimately endorse the other and the encounter itself strange lights it was after 10 p.m on the 28th of october of 1972 five navy personnel corporal juan fuentes jose gomez hector jimenez along with officer in charge francisco cascudo and the telegraph operator jose lima were playing cards following their evening meal Fuentes checked his watch and excused himself to carry out his generator inspection duties. The generator units were near the lighthouse opposite of the barracks. And as he stepped outside, the lighthouse standing at over 200 feet looked down on him almost menacingly. Um, before he could take more than a few steps, however, strange lights on top the generator roof 
around 20 feet from the ground caught his attention. He stopped in his tracks. The lights looked like the headlights of a car. He backed up and he went inside. He, without notifying any other men who were on the other side of the building, he got his pistol and he went back outside and proceeded to approach the generator at the foot of the lighthouse. He could see now that whatever the object was, there were several lights of multiple colors, yellow, white, and violet. He continued forward, but slowly. He could see a figure at the base of the mystery object moving around. He noticed a second figure making its way down to the roof from the object. Immediately, a third figure emerged, this one taller than the first two, and he would estimate the taller figure to be around six foot, while the first two appeared to be closer to five foot. It was then that all three of them suddenly turned around to face the approaching Fuentes, and he stopped immediately. He was around 30 yards from the generator when the three mystery figures turned and faced him. His first instinct was to was fear, and partly through his military training, raise his pistol in a firing position. But as he went to extend his arm fully, something stopped him from completing the motion. He would later struggle to explain what stopped him from doing so. He described a vibrating feeling in his arm as well as feeling paralyzed and unable to lift the weapon. He also recalled a strange, almost telepathic, telepathic communication telling him don't shoot because it's useless. He remained where he was, noticing the figures moved in a slow, bumbling manner. He later recalled thinking that the suits, which covered their entire body, had been extremely heavy. This is a detail that is almost identical to the aforementioned Facini case over two decades previously on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in Italy. He would also say that the figures had elongated heads. They got elongated heads, you all. Um, while this would perhaps fit with descriptions of gray aliens, it is more probable that it is a reference to some kind of a head garment, probably part of the suit itself. Well, what if it was the cone head, you all? Really, what if it was? After several minutes, certainly no longer than a minute, the beings begin to re-enter the craft, which had a distinct metallic quality to the exterior. And as the figures went back inside the object, it was obvious to Fuentes from the motions of their bodies that they were climbing some type of steps to do so. The door closed with a sideways motion and it began to rise directly upward. When it was slightly higher than the top of the lighthouse, a bright fireball shot from the underside and the craft vanished at break neck speed so a fireball you all so you know those fireballs you see in the sky shooting stars it's probably them really it is boom look at that that's that's the shape of some security cameras like that dome shape you all it really is you know what this looks like this right here looks like what was over the observatories in hawaii on the canada france hawaii telescope the south facing camera the great big white thing in the sky right there and they shut the cameras down ever since uh, December the 7th. You will not see any footage coming out of there at all. No time lapse anymore because we documented way too much information. They stopped doing the time lapse videos. I just want you all to know, uh, yes, yes, they stopped it. Too much attention was being drawn to them. So Fuentes remained for a moment watching the sky. And despite the ferocious speed with the craft uh, vacating the area, a low humming sound. The action was otherwise silent. There was no other mysterious crafts overheard, overhead, and he returned inside. And when he arrived, they were still playing cards. All noticed how pale the young corporal was and that he had his pistol in his hand. And he informed him what he saw. And they were dismissive of the sightings, although Cascudo quietly took in the details. So while it isn't certain... It would appear that Cascudo would pass on the report to the superior. Um, this time, the details were meticulously recorded, and Fuentes' account was treated with much more seriousness, so much that two special agents from the American embassy would speak to the high-ranking officer in an off-room immediately following his interview with Fuentes. 
They would then offer him several drawings of a strangely shaped crafts and discs. He was asked to highlight which one of those was the closest to the object that he saw. Then the interest from the military and the American embassy ceased, at least officially, while Fuentes would tell of the account and the incident would be investigated by several UFO researchers, it remains unexplained. And the fact that the American embassy would be interested in a sighting that officially the U.S. government has no interest in is perhaps a telling sign in itself, you all. So this is really interesting. All of it. Very interesting. This is uh, kind of what this looked like right here. This is this is wild, this stuff right here. All of this stuff that they've got going on. So that was that one, you all. Landing and giant occupant encountered by a youth in Virginia. May of 1971 in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Walking through a large open field, a boy with his dog observed a glowing thing over a pond located in the open field. The object moved toward the youth, finally stopping near the youth, and slowly settled to the ground. After the craft landed, a door opened straight down toward him, and a man walked out. According to the witness's description, the creature was powerfully huge. The being returned to the object, and about 10 minutes later, the craft just lifted off. So this was a being... And um, he was a man, and he was very huge. This is in Virginia. This is a landing, a humanoid occupant, an animal reaction, and children. A UFO with a humanoid encountered to, by two forestry workers in Finland. Two young men, on February the 5th of 1971, were walking, they were working in the woods when Ali Ranta noticed a 15-foot UFO descending in a clearing 50 feet away. As it landed, a little entity just under three feet tall glided to the ground from an opening on the underside. Through three windows on the UFO, three more entities could be seen. As the humanoid was rising into the air, one of the men grabbed it by the heel of its boot with its bare hand and he found it burned like a hot iron and he had to let go at once. This is um, Tapani um, Kunagas. It's a standard case. It's a humanoid occupant, landing physical, psychological effects, and there's a physical trace that occurred, you all. UFO on the near Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, June the 27th of 1970. This incident, which took place in broad daylight, is notable because it was certainly observed by at least eight witnesses. A great metallic disc came down on the surface of the South Atlantic Ocean. The disc remained on the surface of the water for half an hour, and two crewmen were seen inside it. When the disc took off, it left behind it on the sea a sort of ring or hoop. So this was a group sighting on the water. So we know the UFOs, they can go on the water. They can go under the water. If they can sit on top of the water, they can go under the water, you all. Two skiers encounter a humanoid at uh, Mjarvi of Finland, January the 7th, 1970. Arano Heinonen and Esko Vidaljo were out skiing when they encountered a 10-foot-wide UFO that approached and hovered near them. A bright light beam was emitted, and a thin, 3-foot-tall humanoid creature appeared, carrying a black box with a pulsating yellow light. Severe and extensive psychological effects were suffered by the witnesses after the encounter. Two years later, Heinonen had a series of contacts with a female extraterrestrial being. Oh, wow. Let's see if we can find that, you all. In, um, in Finland, January the 7th, 1970, 
Finland UFO. Let me see that. January a J A N U R A L A seven one nine seventy Finland UFO. Let me do UFO. Let's see if we can get it. See what it brings up. Boom! We got it. Was that it? Yeah. See if there's any more detail. No, I don't. Okay, that's good. That's good. We got it, you all. Let's look at this. So, look at that. Was this it? Oh, yeah, they were skiing. So, this is what it looks like for them. Looks like it got a cone head, too. So, 1970 humanoid encounter in Mjarve, Finland. It's a 15-minute read, you all. 4.45 p.m. is when this was sighted. Uh, in a rural area, three foot tall humanoid creature, very thin arms and legs. Its face was like wax. Um, he didn't notice the eyes, but the nose was very strange. The nose was like a hook rather than a nose. The ears were very small and narrowed toward the head. The creature wore some kind of an overall in a light green material. On its feet were boots of a darker green color which stretched above the knees. There was also white gauntlets going up to the elbows, and the fingers were bent like claws around the black box. Um, it's a close encounter of the third kind. Close observation with animate beings associated with an object. The object was 10 foot wide. It was metallic and luminous red mist. Um, there was multiple witnesses. Um, it's a definitive sighting in a catalog, Alien Contact, the first 50 years. Listen to that, the first 50 years. It's in a humanoid database. They were out skiing, and they encountered a 10-foot-wide UFO, hovered near them. A bright light beam was emitted, and a thin 3-foot humanoid creature appeared, carrying a black box with a pulsating yellow light. Severe extensive psychological effects uh, happened. Two years later, he was in contact with a female extraterrestrial being. So that was their drawing of the creature. Um, the black box, which emanated the pulsating light, had been aimed at Heinemann. The artist's impression of the incident uh, looked like this. So that's really interesting, you all. Look at that. That's very interesting. In 1987... Uh, of their encounter, I was standing completely still, and suddenly I felt as if somebody had seized my waist from behind and pulled me backwards. I think I took a step backwards, and in the same second, I caught a sight of the creature. I was standing in the middle of the light beam with a black box in its hand. He was. Uh, and out of a round opening in the box, there came a yellow light, which was pulsating. It was 4.45 in, 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 um, in Finland. Four forty-five. 4.45 p.m. Uh, they came down from a little hill to Glade where they usually take a pause and it was sunset and just a few stars were visible in an unclouded sky. It was very cold. They'd been standing for five minutes when they heard a buzzing sound and caught sight of a very strong light moving through the sky. It approached from the north, made a wide sweep, and came at them from the south, descending as it came. A faint buzzing sound became louder the light halted, and they could see a luminous red-gray mist was swirling around it. That's really interesting. Puffs of smoke were thrown up from the top of the cloud. So it was like a cloud, you all. A cloud. The two men stood quiet, s still staring into the air. The cloud was soon down as low as 15 meters. And they could see what was inside of it. It was a round object flat at the bottom, metallic in appearance, and about three meters in diameter. The account, as reported by the GICOFF, says the round craft hovered a while completely motionless above us while buzzing sound could still be heard quite low. Then the huge disc began to descend along the red-gray fog, which became more thin and transparent, and it stopped at a height of three to four meters so I could have touched it if I had reached with my stick. The craft was completely round, completely round, like a ball, I guess. When it came down obliquely toward us, we saw that it had a dome on the upper side. Along the lower edge was a kind of a raised part on which three spheres 
of domes were spaced equidistantly. Oh, wow. That's really interesting, you all. This description. Three spheres of domes place equidistantly. I can't say the word. Never heard that word in my life. From the center of the bottom of the projected, from the bottom projected a tube approximately 25 centimeters in diameter from which suddenly there came an intense beam of light. I don't think we said anything to each other at all. We were completely amazed. We saw the light move a couple times before stopping and intensely illuminating a patch of snow about a meter in diameter with a round, with round it a dark edge, almost coal black and one centimeter wide. He was standing completely still. He felt as if somebody had seized his waist from behind, pulled him backwards. He thinks he took a step backwards, and in the same second, he caught sight of the being. He was standing in the middle of the light beam with a black box in its hand, and out of a round opening in the box, there came a yellow light pulsating. The creature was about 90 centimeters tall, very thin arms and legs. Its face was pale like wax. He did not notice the eyes, but the nose was very strange. It was a hook rather than a nose. The ears were very small and narrowed toward the head. The creature wore some kind of an overall of a light green material, and on its feet were boots of a darker green color, which stretched above the knees. There was also white gauntlets going up to the elbows, and the fingers were bent like claws around the black box. The creature stood in the middle of the bright light. It was luminous like phosphorus, but its face was very pale. Its shoulders were very thin and slanting, with thin arms like a child's. I did not think of the clothes, only noticing that they were greenish in color. On its head was a conical helmet, shining like metal. There's a cone head again. A conical helmet, shining like metal, and the creature was less than one meter tall. Um, suddenly, it turned and directed the opening of the box toward Heinenen. The pulsating light was very bright, almost blinding. It was very silent in the forest. Suddenly, a red-gray mist, I'm about choking, <laughs> came flowing down from the object, and large sparks started to fly from the illuminated circle of snow. The sparks were like tapers, about 10 centimeters long, red, green, and violet. They floated out in long curves, rather slowly, and many of them hit me, but though I expected them to burn me, I did not feel anything. The sparks were shining in several colors. It was very beautiful. At the same time, the red mist became thicker and hid the creature. Suddenly, it was so dense that I could not see Arano, even though I knew he was standing only a few meters away from me. Uh, he could only just see Esco. Heinenen said I could only see Esco. The mist was very thick and I could no longer see the creature. Um, the being they saw was perhaps 15 to 20 seconds, no longer. Suddenly the beam melted. It flew like a flickering flame and it was suddenly sucked up into the gap of the craft. After that, it was as if the fog curtain was torn into pieces. The air above us was empty. I don't think you can say that we were afraid. We were laughing and talking about this light, but at the same time, we felt a little uneasy. They stayed there for approximately three minutes. Gradually, they became aware of a numbness on his right side, Heinenen. And when he stepped forward on his skis, his right leg would not support him, and he fell down in the snow. My right leg had been nearest to the light, and my whole leg was stiff and aching. My foot was as if it was anesthetized. And um, the other guy, Veligio, it was growing dark. And he asked Arano if we should be on our way. And I thought he was joking. And he sat down in the snow and he said that he couldn't get up. He was so tired over and over again. So here's where the symptoms. Veligio had to half carry and half drag his friend home some three kilometers in distance. When they got home, his mother said... It, it was so dark outside, they knocked on the door, which they don't usually do. And when I opened the door, Arano was outside leaning against Esco. I helped them in, and neither of them seemed frightened. Esco's face was red and swollen, and we got Arano to a sofa. Uh, Heinen said, I felt ill. My back was aching. 
all my joints were painful. Okay, you all, we got an aching back. We got joints that are painful. This is something that we've all been experiencing, is it not? We have had our joints aching, uh, painful, our backs hurting. Yes, my head ached after a while and I had to vomit. There's something going on here, you all. There is something going on. This extraterrestrial thing, whatever that you use, it caused his back to ache. His joints were painful, all of them. His head was aching. When he went to the bathroom, the urine was nearly black. Oh my gosh. It was like pouring black coffee onto the snow. And this continued for a couple of months. Then Viljo said, I hurried to the nearest neighbor who lived 600, kilom 600 meters away, and he had a telephone. Uh, the first two doctors I called could not come, but Dr. Kajanjoa, Kanajo, Kajanoja said he would meet us at the Heinola Clinic in an hour's time. So the neighbor drove him there. Uh, the doctor, Heinonen, complained about his aching joints and his headache. The doctor prescribed sleeping pigs and pigs, <laughs> pills. The next day, sedatives telling him the symptoms would be gone in 10 days, but they continued. Heinonen was unable to work, and in May, he was reported he was still ill with pains in his head and his neck, you all. Okay, this is really strange, you all, because people, you know, you we had, um, felt like our neck was whiplash. Remember that? Um, and that lasted for a long time. Okay, the, the least effort tired him. The numbness in his right leg had gone, but he still had trouble with his balance. His memory was so bad that if B left home, he had to say where he was going so that he could be picked up if he did not return. A visit to the site of the incident made him feel worse. Several people who had visited the site said Viljo had felt sick for some days afterward, and he wondered if the place was infected in some way. He, too, suffered after effects, including headaches and eye troubles. The doctor said, I think the men have suffered a great shock. Uh, Viljo was very red in the face and seemed a little swollen. Okay, you are how many people have woken up from their sleep and their face has been completely swollen? Now, I know that we remember getting comments like that. Right after your dream state, you woke up and your face was swollen. Just like this. That's right, you all. Oh, my gosh. Both seemed absent-minded. They talked quickly and incoherently. I could not find anything clinically wrong with Heinemann. He did not feel well. But that could have been his stomach reacting to the shock. The symptoms he described are like those after being exposed to radioactivity. Unfortunately, I had no instrument to measure it. As to the black urine, it seems inexplicable. Possibly it could have been blood in it. Boiled alive in his stomach and his body is blood. Oh my gosh. But this cannot go on for several months. If blood samples had been taken, they might have rebuilt changes in his blood. Both men seemed sincere, and I don't think they had made the thing up. I'm sure they were in a state of shock when they came to me. Something must have frightened them. A strange thing happened in June of 1970 when the two witnesses revisited the site together with a Swedish journalist and a photographer and an interpreter. The hands of the three strangers suddenly became red. And Heinonen had to leave the site with a powerful headache. These were confirmations, you all. On the same day, at the same time as the skiers had their experience, two other people saw a bright light in the sky. A farmer's wife, 15 kilometers, uh, was on her way home to the, way to the cow house when she saw the strange light in the direction. And in Pas Paso, 10 kilometers north, the son of a household had gone out for firewood, and he observed the light phenomenon at 445. Statements from experts. The professor in electrophysics at Helinski University was very interested in the incident. He said, we cannot exclude the possibility that the injuries could have been caused by electrical radiation, but both state that the light was blinding and it was white. So I, it can't have been an ultraviolet radiation, which is always bluish, 
Besides, it doesn't penetrate the clothing. So if the radiation penetrated Heinen's clothing, it must have been a short wave radiation, such as an X-ray. An overdose of these symptoms would, an overdose, uh, these would cause symptoms such as those that were reported. There is much electrophysics which has yet to be explored. And the only to mention the ball lightning, we know that ball lightning exists. But the physical laws defining its existence have yet to be established. According to the known laws of physics, ball lightning should blow up immediately, but it doesn't. The incident at Hanola seems likely to be an abnormal electrical phenomenon. And then they have the Institute for High Voltage Research. Uh, they did not think the phenomenon was related to any type of ele atmospheric electro electricity. Soil, vegetation, and snow samples from the site were sent to Chalmers Institute of Technology for Radiation Test, but revealed no more than normal background radiation. Um, to complicate the situation, um, they have to consider Heinemann's claim that between the time of the incident in 19 and August of 1972, he had no less than 23 further UFO sightings, 23 other ones after that. As if that were not enough, he became a contactee, and on two occasions he met with an extremely beautiful space woman after a loud female voice had directed him to a secluded rendezvous. At the first encounter, he also saw a man standing about 60 meters behind the woman. She was wearing a yellow trouser shoot, suit, which rustled when she moved. She was one and a half meters tall with shoulder-length hair and blue eyes, a description recalling Adamski's Venasian. She didn't walk like a human, but she floated or hovered. Though she looked about 20, she told him she was 180 years old, as Miniger's Venasian did. In her hand, she held a silvery ball with three aerials pointing at Heinonen. Fortunately, she spoke Finnish and began her conversation with Haiva, a paiva, paiva, how do you do? She told him she came from a green and pleasant land. Three different species of humanoid had visited M Mjarve, she said, and some smaller than her, some of her height, 140 centimeters, and some about two meters high. She said that the January incident had lasted three minutes, not just a few seconds, as the two witnesses had thought. At their second meeting, Meeting Heinonen again asked where she came from. She told him to hurry home and she would see the beautiful, he would see the beautiful craft that she had come in. And indeed, when he got home, he saw an object some five to seven meters in diameter in the sky. On each occasion, Heinonen spoke with the space woman for five minutes, but can recall surprisingly little of what was said. On another occasion, both he and Villijo saw a being in Villijo's home, a being little more than 1.5 meters wearing a gray suit with white stripes, suddenly stepped out of the wall, stepped out of the wall and remained standing in the middle of the floor and the two men gaped at it, gaped at it for 30 seconds. Swedish ufologist has drawn attention to the failure of Heinonen and Villijo to offer anything by the way of concrete evidence. Uh, I think it's concrete enough. On one occasion, Heinonen received a green pen from the space beings, but he lent it to the researcher and it was never seen again. He was given a stone, but made to throw it away. When he tried to photograph the space woman, both she and his camera disappeared. Viljo, too, tried to take a photograph of a mysterious light, but the camera was knocked out of his hand and the film was burned to ashes. All in on, Liljurin concludes their accounts are more like sagas and myths than a logical contact attempt by an intergalactic civilization. Well, of course you're going to have a doubter saying something like that. Without question, these later accounts undermine the credibility, so we're not going to read any of that, you all. So if their UFO was real, uh, experiences causes the witness to have imaginary. Listen to that, you all. Imaginary. That's really funny. It's a cloudy, look at this, curious postscript, a 16-year-old, uh, and another one, you all. So these are references, and this is what has happened. That was a really good um, encounter right there because of the symptoms that was, um, let, me, let me put this link in here, you all, because these are the symptoms that people have been 
saying that they have been feeling, let me come over here, uh, from their dream state when you wake up, I woke up with swollen joints. My knees felt like they were got busted, okay? Uh, and other people have had swollen face, swollen face, back aches, headaches, oopsie. There you go. That's right. Body snatchers. Danny Lovett. It could be body snatchers. Something was going on, you all, with all of that. Um, that is wild. Mm -mm. That is so wild. That's that one of that humanoid right there. The two skiers who encountered a humanoid. Oh, we're almost at the bottom. Let's might as well finish this out. I think we are. Um, a UFO and occupants seen near Cowichan Hospital in British Columbia, Canada. Um, in January the 1st of 1970, uh, Duncan, British Columbia, Canada, Miss Doreen Kindle, a practical nurse at the Cowichan District Hospital on Vancouver Island, was looking out the window of the ward when she saw 60 feet away an object so big and bright I could see everything clearly. There were two male-like figures in the craft, one behind the other. One of the men eventually looked right at Doreen, and the craft started to move away, but not before Frida Wilson, a registered nurse, also saw the object. Um, this is... Um, you, would you all like this right here uh, that I'm reading from in the comment section? Because we can put it in the comment section is what we can do. Because it, it's nice to look at. It really is really nice for a reference. Okay, that's perfect. We're going to put that in there. This is what I'm reading from right here. So you all can see it too. Right there. Boom. You got it. That's right. We got it, you all. Because it's really interesting. UFO with Michelin Man occupants. Um, Indian Ocean near France. Let's look at this circular object with dome and two figures inside. Small domed UFO with figures inside. Um, two children encounter UFO with small humanoid beings. Uh, Valenceau, France landing. Um, Sakuro Zamuro UFO incident. UFO three beings hover over a dock do dock in Minnesota. You are this is all over the place. It's all over the world. Red glowing objects all over the world. Florentine Taylor taken aboard a UFO and given a message. What was she given? Or he? Mario, walking through the wood, uh, he came up a cylinder which opened up and two beings emerged. They took hold of the witness gently under his armpits and led him into the empty interior of the object. The only part Zucala could remember was a message that they would return to give him a message for humanity. What is the message that he was supposed to give humanity in 1962 from Sicily, you all? We got to find it out. Uh, April the 10th, 1962... We got to write it down. April the 10th, A P R I O 101962. Um, is that what it was? 1962. San Cassiano. Um, let me do this. S A N Cassiano. I don't know how to spell it. I don't. Cass. Cassiano, C A S C I A C O S C A S C A S I Cassiano, Italy. Let me do this. You are UFO. Let's see. Why didn't? Why did? Why can't? Why weren't we be told about this right here? Really? Let's see if we can pull this up. We can do it. We can. We can look at this. Oh, look at this. It looks kind of like the one that the Air Force shows. with all dark and blurred. You see that? These right here. This shape right here is what I documented in the sky, too. This is like shows up on the edge detect. Look at that. This is how they look. Um, it's exactly how they look. So, Cassiano, let's look at this sighting time. Let's see. what the, I want to know what the message was. Another cone head. A cone head, you all. Florentine Taylor taken aboard the UFO. I want to know what was said, the summary, the for the full report, um, details. He was unable. Um, they were one and a half meter tall, dressed in metallic suits, wearing helmets, 
surmounted by an antenna. They had an antenna on their helmet. Let's do this. will be the last one we do. 12, twilight of 9 o'clock on an April evening. Uh, the tailor Mario was walking home through a wood, and when he came to a crossroad clearing, a path crossed a small canal. He felt himself struck by a gust of wind. Okay, so if you all, this list is, he was struck by a gust of wind. Am I not over there, you all? How did this get over here on me like this? Struck by a gust of wind. I don't know what's going on with my um, thing here. I got to restart it. I got to make sure that I'm seeing what you're all seeing. He was struck by a gust of wind. Um, okay, we got it. Struck by a gust of wind, sharp gust of wind. An object like an inverted bowl passed overhead and came close to the ground about six to seven meters away. From its underside came a cylinder which opened up revealing a diffuse white light from which two beings emerged. They were 1.5 meters tall, dressed in metallic suits, wearing helmets surmounted by an antenna. They took hold of the witness gently under his armpits and led him to an empty interior of the object, which was lit by the same diffused light, and he was unable to make out any of the details of the interior. I'm really wondering while we're reading this, if uh, any of these encounters, if people on here, if you have seen or even experience with some of these things that some people have told experiencing, because that would really add validity to it too, even though you experienced it and that's validity enough. Uh, I'm not going to invalidate any of it. I'm not. Uh, so they got hold of him. They let go of him as a voice from the inner part of the object like one amplified by a microphone, and as if resounding in a vast space, they spoke to him in Italian. The only part Zucala could remember was a message that at the fourth moon, they would return at one in the morning to give him a message for humanity. He was then escorted out of the object and somehow found himself outside his own door. His wife had heard four loud knocks, which he does not remember making, and found him terrified on the front porch. He was very nervy that night, and no traces were found out the site. Zakola later claimed to have been contacted again and to have been given half a message, which he kept in a locked case, and the other half being given to someone in another European country. Now, we don't know what it was. That's about right. We have no idea what that was, you all. That's kind of sad. We don't know. We don't. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Eagle Counter, Close Encounter, Wisconsin. Uh, two Michelin Man beings. Are you all hearing this? Michelin Man beings? Don Miguel um, Timmermans Sabellas, a teacher, was on a motorcycle when he discerned a strange human-like being about 150 meters away. He was completely red from head to foot, rather tall, something like two meters, six foot to seven foot or more, having trouble walking, and his walking was like a robot with stiff arms. A second similar but shorter being was seen. They were the classic shape of the Michelin Man, which had been reported in UFO landing cases in different parts of the world. Have you all, I never knew that, you all. That is wild. Right there under our noses. Right there under our noses. Wow, Charles Foster. Saucer-shaped object with a dome with two occupants in New Zealand. Um, in New Zealand. Father Gill, Papua New Guinea, sighting, uh, Amer Anglican priest mission in uh, Basani, Papua New Guinea, one humanoid figure on top, two consecutive evenings, about 25 natives, including teachers, medical technicians, also observed the phenomenon. They signaled the humanoids and received an apparent response. This is one of 60 sightings within a few weeks in New Guinea. New Guinea, 1959. 
Cigar-shaped UFO occupants through windows in 57. Kelly Hopkins goblins encounter. She had a counter with the goblins. Oh, wow. Later described the creature, three to four foot creature walking toward them with their hands up, surrendering. Um, large eyes, long, thin mouth, large ears, thin, short legs, hands ending in claws. Uh, 1954 cinema landing encounter with humanoids, you all. So I've put the link to all of this, the Flatwoods monster. I've put the link to these, is what I've done, in the in the um, description, not the description, in the live stream, the link to this right here about these um, sightings of UFOs around the world. That's just, that's not even, that's not even the tip of the iceberg. It's not, it's not. There's so many more that have went un, untowed. Uh, that's okay, you all. We can continue to look at more another time, but you all, this is really wild what's going on to say that they don't know if UFOs exist when you have so many eyewitnesses accounts, so many encounters. Um, yeah. And it sounds like a lot of different species too. It does. A lot of different species. So um, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you for watching. It's really interesting. I was really, thought it was very interesting. And the symptoms that they told the two skiers about the swollen face woke up and their face was all swollen. Not even, he wasn't even woke up. They had made it to the house with a swollen red face. You know, there's something going on and to have us experiencing it in our dream state, what's happening? What's happening? Are we being abducted in our dream state? Really? Swollen joints and stuff. Um, all of it. Uh, thank you, Apple Brooks. Yeah, thank you all. Um, if there's any other moderator on here, thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you all for your comments. Check out that link um, that I put there. It's on there. So um, with that being said, hello wherever you are in any part of the world. Hello from my heart to yours. Love you. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. You all thank you so much. This is really interesting. I like reading stuff like that. I do because I know that UFOs exist. They do. I've seen one when I was a little child, and I've seen the men in black. Um, just like a lot of other people, they've had their own encounters and stuff that they can tell about. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you.